Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to our next episode of your viewer submissions that you sent in to me. These are your true crime stories. I am just reading them from the emails that you sent me. If you have a story that you want to submit, you can do so at sherilynstories at gmail.com. Before we get started, I just want to quickly, you know, shamelessly promote something for myself. I mean, it's not a really big deal. I'm just super excited about it because I think it's so, it looks so cute. And if you follow me on Instagram, you already saw it. But if you don't, then you then maybe you didn't and it's something that you want to know about. So I just want to let you know that I have new merch designs out there and they're super cute and I'm really excited for them. And I think it perfectly showcases my obsession with the 90s, especially like 90s horror and comedy and just like meshing it with my stuff. I've got the little scream guy cartoon holding a phone and a knife saying hi 911 why am i like this a few of you told me that i needed to put that on merch and when i saw that design i was like this is perfect <laughs> we got wednesday adams as a sippendale sipping her poison i redid the little jurassic jail dinosaur to a much more adorable little guy <laughs> it just felt more me i mean he's still badass and he will rip people's heads off but he's cute Anyways, if you haven't checked it out, I just wanted to throw it out there. It's out there, no pressure. Just wanna let you know, there's new stuff. This isn't about me, this is about all of you, so I'm gonna get started right now. All right, the first story says, hello, my name is Sarah. Before I begin, I have to say, I love your channel and the direction you are going with these stories. I think it is important to get our stories out there. I couldn't agree more. I understand that you are getting a lot of these stories and I think that's so cool. This one is about a drunk driver who crashed into my classmate from college. Let me preface the story by saying that this classmate of mine and I never talked, but she was so respectful of me and my mental health and when I said I wanted to ride bulls and do rodeo. How cool. My dad used to ride bulls, not the rodeo, just dangerously rode them at my uncle's farm. So as soon as I found out about my classmate's death, I hated myself so much that I never said hi or even talked to her. But I feel at peace now knowing she wouldn't want me to hate myself. I am also writing a letter to her to put on her grave and visiting her soon. Her name was Fallon Montanucci, I think. I hope I'm saying that right. She was an amazing human being whose life was cut too short. She was 22 years old on leave, she was supposed to go back the day after the accident. The driver who hit her was driving on the wrong side of the road, meaning that he was going north on a south road. The speed was 65 miles per hour, so Fallon was going the speed limit and the driver was going 102 miles per hour when he hit Fallon head on. I should probably mention that Fallon's sister Avalon was in the car too and she suffered critical injuries. Thankfully, Avalon is okay now, but Fallon was pronounced dead on the scene. The drunk driver who hit her had two DUIs already, but this is his third one and he basically got off scot-free the first two times. That, ooh, ooh. A little bit more on Fallon. She touched many lives and selflessly enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. Her crewmate said she was always pushing herself and others to make them the best they could be. After she graduated basic training, she had the job of protecting these dangerous missiles the Air Force would use. If it was raining, snowing, 3 a.m., 3 p.m., and those missiles would be threatened, she would run and protect them no matter what. Wow. I can't imagine waking up from a hospital and knowing that your sister is gone. She and I never talked, but you don't have to talk to someone in order to know them and them have an impact on your life. Honestly, when she passed, I hated myself so much for all the words never said and I wanted to die, but I take comfort now in my favorite memory I have with her. I would show up to a class I hated and she would sit across the table from me. She wasn't in the class with me, but she was sitting in the lobby and I would walk into the lobby through the two doors with my two cups of coffee and she would always look up at me with those beautiful eyes of hers and she probably thought I was crazy because I would always drink two coffees every day before class, but it's my favorite. I wanted to let people know that drunk driving takes more than just one life away. The grief affects everyone that knows the victims. This is so true. Thank you so much for sharing this. I know it's not essentially true crime related, but it is a crime to drink and drive. You've taken somebody's life selfishly. It's so unnecessary. Drunk driving killings are so unnecessary. It just, I mean, I'm sure you can feel how livid I get just thinking about it. And you're so right. It's the grief trickles. This one decision affected so many lives. Lives that she touched that she didn't even know or get a chance to know that she touched. Thank you for sharing this story. She truly does sound like an absolutely incredible woman. And this is obviously a huge loss to the world. Don't drink and drive, please. If you don't have money for the Uber, you don't have money to go out. That's always the way that I see it. If you don't have a way to get home, 
and you think you need to drive because you spent all your money getting shit canned, you can't get yourself back home, you didn't have the money to go out in the first place, okay? Please, please just stay home or have a designated ride of sorts set up. All right, this next story says, hello, my name is Alex and my grandmother, Kathy Whitehead, was brutally tortured and eventually murdered. First, I'd like to say thank you for giving me this opportunity. You guys don't have to thank me. Thank you for sharing these and putting this out there and helping so many people who read this or see this, I guess, because I guess I'm reading. You know, I feel as though not enough people have heard her story. From what I know, she was an amazing woman and I've been told by multiple family members I resemble her a lot. So to start off, my grandmother, Kathy, was born October 22nd, 1961. She was the daughter of her dad, Cecil Lee Tucker, and her mom, Laverne Weathers Tucker. Ooh, those sound like really awesome country singing names. She got pregnant with my dad, Tony, and gave birth to him on June 29th, 1976. My dad's father left Kathy before she gave birth to my dad. I believe that's how it went, but my dad didn't specify to me. Also, spoiler, my dad's half-brother found my dad on Facebook, and they had a DNA test done between him and my dad's dad, and we found out that side of the family about 10 years ago, I believe. That is so cool. I've heard so many stories about this. This would be another cool little venture, probably not on the true crime channel, but maybe in another future one where I'd love to hear these like reunited stories. I love those. She was engaged to this man named John Short, who had a crazy ex-wife named Hazel Short. Hazel was very jealous of Kathy and John's relationship, so much to the point of doing the unbelievable to Kathy. On April 14th, 1983, my dad was only six years old. A man named Donald Glenn Everett, who is Hazel's daughter's husband, I believe, knocked on Kathy's door telling her that her husband was on the payphone outside the apartment wanting to talk to her. She went down to the payphone where she was kidnapped and thrown in the trunk of a car and stabbed in the arm and then drove to a different town where they burned her in a fire alive, threw her in the truck of a different car with a blanket to quote, keep her warm and then strangled her to death with a wire. Oh my gosh. They then threw her body down a well. Oh my gosh. And that's where her mutilated and unrecognizable body laid for little less than a year. They couldn't perform an autopsy because there was nothing they could get other than her identification. They only found her because Donald came forward and told the police where they could find her body. I'm not sure if that's exactly how it went down with Donald, but that's what I remember. Hazel, Hazel's daughter, Tina, Tina's husband, Donald, and Hazel's nephew, Nikki Ford, were all involved in some way and all sentenced to prison. I only know how long Hazel's sentence was. She was sentenced to life in prison in two different countries. She was released in 2018 and no one alerted our family about it. Oh my gosh. My dad still struggles with the loss of his mother to this day. I wish I could take the pain and anger away from him. Oh. If this story sounds familiar, it was aired on a TV show called Your Worst Nightmare and the episode is called Cooking with Fire. It's not the most accurate story, but my dad is in it being interviewed. It's taken me over an hour to type this. Even though I didn't know her, I still feel a strong connection to her. I am filled with anger towards the awful woman who did this, and I don't think my grandma got the justice she deserved with Hazel being let out. No kidding. Anyways, thank you for listening, and I can't wait to see this posted for her. Oh my gosh, thank you for being an advocate for her and sharing her story and making sure that she isn't forgotten even when you didn't even get the chance to know her. That's so powerful. I don't know if you believe in this, but I definitely do. It sounds like she is very much with you still for you to have that connection and not even having known her. I'm so sorry for your and your family's loss, but thank you so much for sharing her story. All right, the next one says, hello. I really love what you're doing by giving people a space to talk about these stories that we aren't ever really given the opportunity to speak on. My heart goes out to everyone who has shared their stories and even to those who aren't at that stage yet, you are all so loved. Now on to my story. For some clarification that I feel might be important, I'm a trans man, but when this story occurred, I was not yet out. I wanted to preface this because I know that it does partly change the impact the story has, and I'm hoping that the one young girl who is going through something similar doesn't just dismiss it because I will be referring to myself as a man throughout the story. Crimes happen to everyone, obviously, but I remember what it was like back then and how easy it was for me to write things off as not the same because of one small difference that was insignificant. So please do not be like me. I was about 12 to 14 when this occurred. 
I don't remember exactly when it started, but I grew up in a very emotionally neglective household where love bombing was the only form of love my parents knew how to give. I was being horribly bullied at school, the unalive yourself type, and most of my friends would secretly talk behind my back or were only friends with me out of pity. A very lonely boy, that's what I was. So I turned to the internet because the only good people in my life were from there already. And I went on Meet Me, and then in brackets it says my yearbook. I've never heard of this site before. I'm assuming it's a chat. And I started to try to make better friends. I set my location away from my city and state so my parents would not have a way of finding out about my account. It was against their rules. I thought that meant I was safe. About a week into having the account, I met a young boy named Sam. He was cute, friendly, and he gave me the attention that I craved so much. I gave him my number, but when he texted me, it came from an email, I think. I was still using a flip phone during all of this, so it showed up really strangely there, and it gave me a bit of a bad vibe, but I was beyond desperate for any connection, so I just ignored it. Even his name was different. Stuart, not Sam but no big deal, right? Being young and dumb is something we all went through, right? I feel ashamed to share this next part because I still feel as though this was all my fault. But he started to ask for pictures, the not suitable for work kind. I played it safe at first, just sent a photo of my bra here and there, but I made one very important mistake with these seemingly safe photos. I left my face in them. Sam quickly became one of the worst parts of my day. Anytime my phone went off, I would dread that it was from him and it usually was. I had no one else. He began to ask for more revealing photos, but when I would refuse, he would threaten me. Threaten to upload those previous photos onto the internet, not even sure where on the internet. Looking back, I would much rather take those photos online over everything that unfolded next. I was more scared of losing what little affection my parents gave me than whatever this creepy 15-year-old stranger from the internet could ask me to do. Therefore, I did whatever he asked. The more things I did, the more ammunition he had against me. Life was terrifying. I was already incredibly suicidal and I had thought about taking my life more times than I can count. I'd resorted to self-harm and not eating. This went on for months almost a year. And somewhere along the way, I learned that Sam wasn't actually a 15-year-old boy from Pennsylvania, but instead a 27-year-old man named Stuart. Oh my gosh, this is disgusting. I've been hearing so many more people come forward with these types of stories. Before I'm even done, I just have to thank you so much for bringing awareness to this because this is so common. Trigger warning for this next part, self-harm and suicide. One day I stayed home from school. I'm fairly certain it was to end my life while no one was going to be home to stumble on me and save me, but I can't remember. My memory has dwindled due to mental illness. Stuart had other ideas though. He asked to Skype. I got up, downloaded it on our family computer and waited. While on the call, he was pushing my boundaries in every way he could and I was in such a fragile state that I just broke. Since the plan was already to hurt myself, I think my brain just snapped and decided to do it right then on call. I had started to cut myself while he was talking to me about what he wanted me to do next. Not sure he even noticed me crying. But he did notice the blood when I went to wipe away my tears. He stopped. We had a conversation about what was even happening, the why. I don't know if he felt bad or if he was more worried I would die with Skype still on the computer, something that could link back to him. Stuart quickly said that he would stop, delete all my photos and never contact me again call ended. I didn't move from my seat at that computer for a good hour, just sobbing. I had so many close calls of wanting to end my life before that moment, but it was still different. Officially, it felt like I was truly all alone. I didn't care if I went too far that day. I just wanted everything to be quiet. Finally, I got cleaned up, uninstalled Skype. Then I went to my bedroom to cry some more and ended up passing out from the crying so hard. Oh. I remember feeling my heart beating in my skull and wanting it to just stop. I woke up the next day with no new messages from Stuart. I felt a little free, especially after weeks and months went by without anything. Then the worst happened. I got a text message from the police in Pennsylvania. They caught Stuart. He was being arrested for child pornography. He still had my contact info and photos on his computer. That's how they found me. I had to come clean to my mother before they contacted Verizon for my account holder's name. I knew it was under my father's name and I couldn't imagine him knowing. So in front of my sister, I confessed everything. My mom was in contact with the officer on the case. She took my statement to fax him for the trial and everything. I didn't even learn Stuart's real name. To this day, I have no idea. After four months, I figured my punishment was over. Maybe my mom had time to cool off. So I asked if she knew anything about the trial. It felt like the justice system had simply forgotten about me, about all of the other victims he had. Partly true. 
She told me that the FBI had taken over the investigation because it crossed so many state lines and involved minors, but even after everything, crossing jurisdictions and being charged with 27 counts of child pornography and four of statutory rape, he only got five to 10 years on the state level. We've talked about this before. It's, it, it is so messed up. That is so messed up. Even now, a whole decade later, I feel so cheated and let down. How could the Justice Department allow this man the possibility of ever being free again? I don't think this adds to the story, but in the full spirit of letting go, I'm almost 100% sure that some of the images he had of me are on child pornography websites somewhere on the internet. If not still, they were. Oh my gosh. I wish this had a better ending, something more grand, like he got what he deserved, but sadly, the world doesn't work that way. As stated before, I I don't know his actual name nor what he looks like really. I saw one photo of him, so I have no way of knowing if he's out there. I would imagine so. That is terrifying. It has been 10 years. I'm constantly afraid that he remembers me, my name, where I lived. Before realizing I was trans, he was the reason I wanted to change my name. I'm still that terrified of him. Because it's easy to not be as afraid when you know who a monster is or what they look like, but I don't. I've looked on the sex offender registry in Pennsylvania every single year since he was sentenced for anyone named Sam, Stewart, or something similar, and just to see if anyone looks even slightly like him, but there is nothing. This all still haunts me and has taken so much from me. I'm hoping that by sharing this story, I can have some of my power back. Fast forward when I was 19. I was raped by the only friend I had in my city. I moved to a whole other state too. And people always ask me why. Why didn't I report it? It's because of what happened with Stuart. I was basically blackout drunk. It wasn't violent enough. And he was a respectable college guy who came from a really nice Catholic family. I didn't think I would be believed at all. But even if I was, I was so scared the same thing would happen. Justice wouldn't truly be served. I just didn't see a point in putting myself through the justice system again and feeling cheated all over again. Our justice system is incredibly broken. Thank you for reading if you do. And thank you again for doing what you do. You're truly a gem. Grayson, he, him. Thank you so much, Grayson for sharing this. I couldn't agree more. The justice system is so broken, especially in cases like this. I don't know how many times I've said that. It just, it's something that just makes me physically ill to hear and know that people like this just get away with it, basically with a slap on the wrist. What is five years for something like this? It's just, it's hard. I hope by sharing though, like you said, you do feel like you have a little bit more of your power back. There is something so therapeutic and just putting it out there and kind of being like, you don't control this aspect of me anymore. I get to be the one to tell this story. So thank you for being brave enough to do that. All right. Our next story says, hi, Sherilyn. I hope you're enjoying reading our stories as much as we're enjoying hearing you read them for us. I actually have many wild and entirely true stories and I was torn between telling you this one or telling you about the missing child whose rescue I played a part in, but I wouldn't feel comfortable giving you names to verify that one. Although if you want to hear that story with redacted identifying information removed, I'm game. So I'm telling you about the one I can give you a name on for verification purposes. Here it goes. When I lived in Louisiana, I was a notary and frequently took mobile notary work for extra money. Booking an appointment at somebody's house wasn't unusual for me, and for the most part, I went alone to these appointments. Occasionally, a friend would ride along, but I almost never took my children. That being said, November 12th, 2014 was my daughter's 15th birthday, so when she asked to ride along to a signing I booked, I agreed. The house we were going to was in a small town just 20 miles from where we lived, so I thought, why not? It was her birthday after all. I called the client and told him we were on our way. I wasn't familiar with the town of Starks. All I really knew of it was that an abstractor I used to work with had once told me that the map in the... (laughs) Okay, I saw the word and I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I like kind of looked ahead to the next sentence and you've already broken it down so I can pronounce it. Thank you. (laughs) Calcasieu, that the map in the Calcasieu Parish Courthouse had to be replaced because the original one marked the area as being inbred, meaning I knew it was a more remote area and it was probably a little weird. But I didn't know that this meant that many of the winding roads were unmarked, that a recent storm had washed out one of the roads my GPS was directing me towards, or just how truly weird things were going to get. After an hour of driving, we pulled over to call the client so I could explain that we were running very late as we were lost and the road had been washed out. He said no problem, so we kept driving. After another hour, it had gotten pretty dark, but we finally arrived. My daughter saw the house and told me, don't get out of the car, mom. 
Of course, I blew her off as being paranoid because it was dark and the house was badly maintained. To explain badly maintained, let me paint you a picture. The home, which was at least 60 years old, had clearly been built by a previous inhabitant that probably didn't work in construction, was known as a shotgun house. So-called because it's narrow and long with the door at the front and back. When both doors are open, you can fire a shotgun through the front door and the bullet will go straight out the back door without hitting any walls. To the left of the house was a pile of empty Bud Light beer cans. The pile was about two feet wide, a few cans deep, and stretched the entire length of the house. The rest of the small front yard had random, old, and or broken objects scattered around it, and an old car's wheel room was being used as a base for cutting firewood, with an axe leaned against it and a filthy chainsaw sitting in the dirt nearby. I'm not gonna lie, I would have probably had the same reaction as your daughter. <laughs> the back of the house opened to a large wooded area that was overgrown. Even the area closest to the house had high grass and brambles. This specific home also had a screened in front porch that had been added on long enough ago that many of the posts had a thin layer of green moss on them and the boards sagged in the middle. Here decorations, some voodoo and some Halloween themed all made by hand, had been hanging for what appeared indicated had been months or more likely years. If they were going for spooky or eerie, they definitely hit their mark. It's typical in that area of the county for doors of the style of porch to be unlocked so that people can come knock on the house door. So after gathering the paperwork that needed to be signed, with my daughter refusing to leave the car, I don't blame her, I tried the screen door. It was surprisingly locked. I tried knocking, but got no answer. Figuring the client couldn't hear the knock on the flimsy screen door, I tried calling. No one answered the door. I could hear his phone ringing as well as a small dog that sounded like he'd been barking enough that his throat was dry and eventually his answering machine, that's how far still in the past the town is, picked up. After two more unanswered calls, I finally gave up and decided to leave and tell the company who had assigned me the job that the client hadn't been home and that they should send a male notary with his two witnesses in tow for the rescheduled appointment as the client was likely alcoholic and therefore unpredictable. About 10 minutes into the drive home, I realized just how strange it was that the door wasn't answered. On top of the client knowing I was coming, it also occurred to me that I had noticed that there was some kind of mechanical engine running right behind his house. I'd assumed it was a generator as those are common in the state but when I mentioned it my daughter said it was actually an older model pickup truck with the door open idling behind the house not only that but with the client having sounded somewhat elderly over the phone I started to worry that he had been injured or suffered a medical episode so I decided to call the sheriff's office and ask them to do a wellness check with the sheriff saying he'd send somebody out I went on with my night continuing home later the sheriff's office called to say the man was fine and in custody which should have struck me as strange but it didn't so I was able to let it go and thought nothing more of it for the night. Fast forward to the next day I get a call from my then husband from his office. He asked me what the address I had gone to. I told him. Next he asked the client's name. Marlon Bamberg Jr. I said. He sighed, thanked me and told me he'd tell me the story later. Now this part has been relayed to me two ways. One was what my husband said he heard from a homicide detective who was the husband of his co-worker on the case. One was what I read in the newspaper report. I think if you add the two versions together, you can possibly piece it into a coherent timeline. Version number one was when the sheriff's office arrived, there was no answer but the sheriff's office brought an ATV and found him. According to this version, Bamberg got nervous earlier in the day and decided to go back to the body of his victim, who he and another man had killed days before and dumped in a creek and made it smaller, if you know what I mean, so he could hide it better. The gruesome task took longer than he expected, which is why he missed me knocking, and he was found by the sheriff's deputy still in the midst of the deed. Oh my gosh. Thank God he didn't answer. Version two, when the sheriff's office arrived, there was no answer, but a neighbor who had been a witness to the murder saw the police and assumed they were there to arrest Bamberg. So they decided to give them a statement since they thought police already knew what happened. Oh my gosh. If you combine the two stories, it seems that what probably happened is the sheriff's office went out to perform the wellness check that I had requested, but Bamberg wasn't home. While they were looking in the windows to see if there was any sign or trouble or distress, the neighbor probably did come out and talk to the police, who probably had no idea about the murder when they arrived. The neighbor's statement is probably what prompted the sheriff's office to bring the ATVs and hunt him down. Whether or not the body had been damaged, I don't know. The paper didn't mention it, and for all I know, my husband may have embellished the story, 
maybe the information was being withheld for whatever reason. In any event, that's the story. One way or another, the police being there is part of what prompted the witness to make a statement. So that's why I say my daughter and I accidentally helped to solve a murder. Of course, from her point of view, she was right and her mom took her to a murderer's house on her birthday, but that's teenagers for you. All these years later, it's become just a memory and not even my wildest one at that. Anyway, hope you and or your viewers had fun with this one. Stay safe. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm going to give it to your daughter. She was right. You got to listen to her spidey senses more. I'm so glad he wasn't home and didn't answer the door. Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine. Thank you so much for sharing. You have a fabulous way of doing that. And of course, you are always welcome to share more of the stories that you have. Please stop taking your children to murderers' houses. Just kidding. <laughs> All right, our next story. Hey, Sherilyn, I've been your follower for quite a while now and your videos serve as a very good way for me to stay up and alert as I do my work and I truly love the way you tell these stories with so much respect for the victims, survivors, and their families. I've also begun using a few of your words, <laughs> douche monkey and the like. God, those are catching on. Anyway, I'm not even sure if you'd read this story or if it's even worth telling, but hearing some of the stories from the second episode have given me the courage to pen down my own story, if nothing, just to get myself to feel better. And while I'd happily provide you with all the information you need, I won't be using names and identifying factors as I don't want the person knowing that he still affects me. That's understandable. So here goes. When I was around 16, 17, I developed a tiny crush on one of my seniors. And though he was a good three years older than me, he seemed to like me back too. I wasn't sure if I wanted a relationship, but he did. And he threatened to unalive himself if I said no. So I had to date him. And over time, I thought I might like him. And I think I did. The relationship as a whole, looking back, was very, very abusive, and I didn't know if I could get out of it. Now, I have a lot of friends, guys and girls, and I'm a very affectionate person, so it was quite normal for me to hug all of my friends goodbye, or play with their hair, or behave like a little puppy, let them pat my head, play with my curls, etc. around them, with all of their consent, of course. But my ex never liked it. He especially didn't like my boy bestie at all. I can already relate to this very much one of my very, very best friends in the, the entire world, two of my very, very best friends in the entire world are, are both men and have been since we've grown up. And yeah, boyfriends don't really like that. And girlfriends too, it, it went both ways. Once when ex saw me hug my bestie goodbye, he got so mad, he took me to his place and almost forced himself upon me, calling me all sorts of names. And since I was a stupid, 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 oh my gosh, 17 year old, don't say that. You're not at all. I let him, thinking that this would stop him from being so mad. Side note, the legal age of consent in my country is 18, so there's that too. The relationship was abusive to say the least, but I was stupid and didn't know any better, so I stayed put and he kept threatening to kill himself. Oh my gosh. My heart is breaking that you just like feel so silly about all of this and like responsible. My hope for you moving forward before I'm even finishing this is if and when you think about this story again, all of those stupids and blames that you're putting on yourself, you put on that person and you take that away from you. Things only got worse as the relationship progressed and I reached my breaking point when he hit me in public, right across the face before twisting my arm so bad that I have a permanent ligament injury on my wrist. This is when things took a really ugly turn. After this incident, I broke up with him and went on to work. I used to intern at a pretty cool place. My ex stayed outside my office throughout my shift and even followed me home. He lurked in my area all night and the next day when I started going to college, there he was following me. He was calling me, texting me everywhere. When I blocked him, he called and texted from his friends' phones or even pay phones. He even tried contacting my friends. Right now I'm starting to get like Maple Battaglia vibes. It's just breaking my heart. This went on for a week and he didn't stop even after I repeatedly asked him, begged him not to. Thankfully, he couldn't enter my college premises or my house. A week later, he finally stopped and I could breathe. Around this time, I had an event in college that needed me to dress up and I was looking forward to it after the awfulness of my ex. So I dressed up, attended the event, and clicked some adorable pictures, some of which were posted on social media. This was the beginning of Instagram, so everyone had open profiles. Needless to say, my ex saw it. I didn't know this. So the next day after I came out of my office, there he was, standing at the gate, a small knife in hand ready to hurt me. I freaked out and rushed to my boss. He was the only adult who knew about this. 
and he threatened to call the police, which was when my ex left. Though my ex never showed up at the office ever again, he kept coming to my college and outside my house. He even tried to tamper with my vehicle on more than one occasion. I don't remember when and how it stopped, but one day it did, and it took me months and months and months to recover and like a truckload of therapy. It's been over 10 years now, and I'm happily married to this amazing guy, but there are still times when I wake up in the middle of the night to see that shiny, tiny knife ready to stab me. I'm sure you're wondering why I didn't tell an adult. Well, you have to keep in mind that this is India, and though parents are much more understanding now, 10 years ago it wasn't the same. I know now that I could have told my mom, but like I said, I was stupid and my, you are not, and my ex had made me feel like no one would believe me. That's what they do. It's not a you thing, it's a them thing. They are so manipulative and get in your head this is in no way your fault. So I told no one, which led me to a really, really dark place in my life. But let's not go there. At 28, I can see just how idiotic, oh my gosh, I wasn't, and why would happen happen? I had the power to stop it, didn't I? No, absolutely not. People like this, they, they get their talents in. You could be the strongest person in the entire world, think that this would never happen to you, and it, it can. I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> I used to think that I was like the strongest person. It was something like that would never happen to me. And luckily for me, it was only a six month of hell. But after all of these years later, it is something that still affects me. And it's still, I have to work through. You're so not alone. This is absolutely not your fault. I know that no one was seriously hurt or harmed here, but I hope that if you do pick the story, someone who's in the same situation can understand they're not alone and that they can talk it out. I just hope no one ever, ever, ever has to go through this shit. I still suffer the consequences. Thank you, Sherilyn. Cheers and hugs, M. Thank you. You're so right. This could have gone really, really bad though. You followed your gut instinct. You went back in. You told your boss. Please don't think that anything that happened in this situation is your fault whatsoever. I'm so glad you're safe and okay and able to share this story with us and bring attention to it because you would be mind blown at how many stories I get that are very similar to this. By sharing them, you're making other people listening feel like they're not alone and somebody who may experience this in the future have those warning signs to pick up, pick up on much quicker before they get in too deep. All right, this next story has a big trigger content warning, child abuse and neglect death of a child due to abuse. Dear Sherilyn, I have followed your channel for a while now and I've wanted to share this about my friend who has a tragic story but haven't had the best way to do so and I feel like your new series will be the best and most respectful way to do so. No one in my small town seems to speak about the story even though it was hugely discussed at the time. Her name was Charlotte Avenal. Thank you also for showing me how to pronounce that. And she was only eight years old. I knew Charlotte through my mom who was a teaching assistant at her school and since we were the same age, we became friends. I don't remember much about her since I was so young when this happened and also blocking out a lot of this due to the nature of the story. But other, over the years, I've learned more and more by reading articles and speaking to my mom. My mom says she had a great sense of humor, always making everyone laugh. She was very affectionate, wanting to hold hands often and loved playing with the other children running around and smiling like any normal kid. She was super chatty, although she had slurred speech due to her disability and she craved attention from teachers, always wanting to speak with them and be near them. My mom also recalled how much she loved fruit. They always had a box of fruit delivered once a day at school and Charlotte loved it. Now looking back, my mom believes this was because of how she was starved at home. Charlotte had a mental age of three due to being born with a severe brain defect. At school, she was a bit cheeky, as any eight-year-old was, but mostly she was sweet and worked as hard as she could despite her brain defect and the issues going on at home. Uh -huh. Charlotte's school made several reports that she would come to school dressed inappropriately for the weather conditions and was regularly covered in excrement. After these reports were made, her family withdrew her from school and a few months later, these tragic events happened. Social workers had been monitoring Charlotte, but had not seen her since June. They tried to do follow-up appointments, but her family never replied or answered the door when attempts were made. On the 12th of September, 2009, Charlotte was found hanging in her bedroom, wearing filthy pajamas, and the walls of her room were covered in excrement. Oh my gosh, poor baby. She was found dead on her knees with a cord tied around her neck and her face against a radiator. Oh my gosh, this is 
Her scalp was riddled with head lice and her body was extremely dehydrated. It was discovered that Charlotte was locked up in her room for as long as 14 hours every day, having to lie on her bed with sheets that were never changed and having to use a drawer as a toilet. Oh, I'm going to be sick. She had a few toys, but no access to water or food. Her mom, Susan, and stepdad, Simon, didn't care for Charlotte, and their neglect, which, which caused her to die, only cost them 12 months in prison. What? I'm gonna be sick. I'm, like, I'm actually starting to shake. Their excuses for this treatment was that she slept walked, so she had to be locked up at night, and that due to her brain defects, she was challenging to care for. It's believed that Charlotte accidentally hanged after getting tangled in a ribbon on a toy that was hanging from a window. After less than three months in prison, her parents attempted to appeal their sentence but was denied. This is all I sadly have been able to find about Charlotte's story. I wish I knew more about her as a person and not just the horrific things her parents did. She seemed like such a sweet girl from what I can remember and I hope she is at peace now. Thank you, Sherilyn, for telling Charlotte's story. Oh my gosh. <sighs> that that was heavy that was hard thank you so much for sharing and again of just how many times do crimes against children get to just be swept under the rug this is so wrong I don't, and I don't even know where to start with fixing it I'd love to it's something I think about often I think about it so often that it's probably unhealthy and makes me just want to be in a ball and cry and throw up everywhere but it's like every single day there's something like this poor little charlotte i'm so sorry for the loss of your friend obviously she was just such a bright little thing if after all of these years you still remember all those really wonderful fun qualities about her and i hope you're able to hold on to those memories of her and not what these monsters did all right our next story says hi Sherilyn. I've been on your channel for about a year now. So glad I found you and that you're doing this segment. I'm so glad you found me too. I'll be using real names as the story is public and considered solved. I've been good friends with a girl named Maddie since 2018. Before that, we knew each other because I dated one of her classmates at the time and that meant, and that meant we ran in the same circles. In October 2020, the night of the 16th, I was at my best friend's apartment, maybe 10 minutes from my own. Keep in mind, we're talking about the United States. The next day, I was getting dressed after a shower when my boyfriend read out loud an article about a young girl who had been shot and killed at a Halloween party very early that morning. I never forgot the moment I heard him say, Cheyenne Farewell, 20 years old, of Medina. I was shocked. I can't say it's easier to believe today, but we don't have a choice. Maddie and Cheyenne had been friends for years, cheering together and often having the same classes because they were honor students. I had gone to Cheyenne's senior prom, I started working in mental health in 2019, and this was an area of interest for her, so her and I had exchanged, mes exchanged messages a few times about this. She struggled with her mental health, but was an advocate and had done a segment for an associate agency located in Buffalo, New York. Cheyenne was shot and killed in the early hours of October 17th, 2020. Many of us will never forget that date. She was at a Halloween party with her best friend in Lockport, where I lived. My best friend, whose apartment I was at just hours before, lives literally around the corner. A couple of kids much too young for what they were about to do showed up at the party with a gun. This was where the story gets confusing, because many people share their experience from that night, which meant many were under the influence or in shock. Our basic understanding is that the two boys were looking for a member of the Lockport gang. Lockport is barely a city. The idea of a legitimate gang here is laughable to most who wasn't there. They shot through the door and walls, hitting four people and killing one. Cheyenne was the one fatality. Her best friend was hospitalized for injuries. Her parents found out because of all the kids posting videos and making statuses. It was word of mouth. Oh my gosh. That still haunts me. Yeah. The things her mother saw knowing what her daughter went through in her last moments. The murderers were charged and prosecuted. Cheyenne's mother fought for them to be charged as adults. From what we know, they've already been released. These boys were 17 and 16 years old at the time. And they killed a 20-year-old girl they didn't even know. Her birthday is just a few weeks before mine. She was just a couple months shy of 21. She was passionate about wellness and civil rights. She loved a baby and Juice World. To this day, I sob like crazy if I end up on her mom's Facebook. She shares beautiful stories and memories, 
videos and pictures that just remind us that she deserved more. Ooh. I remember at her wake, her father comforted us. I had never seen an open casket before. He held us and said, you know what you need to do, live for her. Oh my gosh. I think about her often as I continue working in the mental health field. My ultimate goal would be to work with at-risk youth. Maybe if they didn't feel so alone and helpless, they wouldn't turn to the streets and crime and violence. Wow. I want to give them the chance they don't believe they have. Oh my gosh. Lockport, New York has seen much crime and tragedy since that day. Young lives taken by vehicular, vehicular, probably one of my least favorite words to read out. <laughs> manslaughter and overdose a new name every day i'm sharing this story because cheyenne deserves to have her story told but this isn't about me this is about cheyenne and the tragedy that took her life way too soon i'd like to shout out her family her mother rochelle father jeff sister Maisie, and grandmother gail and the friends of her i know maddie heather kaya chloe kira deja and lexis there are many more, I just don't know them as much. Thank you for sharing. This is a case I've shared with true crime YouTubers, hoping eventually this case will be covered on a larger scale, and I appreciate you giving me a chance to tell this story. Rhiannon, like the Fleawood Mac song. Thank you so much for sharing, and I really loved to hear all of the beautiful things about Cheyenne too, and not just the tragic end to her life, and how amazing are you that you want to be out there helping at-risk youth so that you can prevent something like this from happening to somebody else's good friend or daughter or sister. You are amazing and I hope you feel so proud of yourself every single day. All right, this is the last story. It says, hi, Sherilyn. I love your videos and I love what you do. So I wanted to share the story of my grandmother's closest friend, Dawn. This is Dawn Brazard's story. Let me start with a little backstory. Dawn Marie Marcel was born alongside her twin sister, Christine, on March 28, 1968, to William and Judith Marcel. She had a pretty normal childhood in Burlington, Wisconsin, and after she graduated high school, she worked as a loan officer for State Financial Bank. Later on, she married David Broussard, and the relationship soon became toxic. Police received several domestic abuse 911 calls from the Broussard household, along with constant complaints of shouting from multiple neighbors. John, Don tried to leave David, but he threatened to kill himself if she did so, which turned her to alcohol. Now on to what happened. On October 24th, 1997, Don left her job at the bank and talked with David in his truck, which was in the parking lot of the bank, for about 15 minutes. David said that he asked Don to go out to dinner with him, but she declined, and she then left his truck and they drove home separately. On October 25th, 1997, Don didn't show up for work, nor did she respond to her family or friends' texts and calls. Both of these things were extremely out of character for Don. Don's family and friends tried to ignore the pit in their stomachs, but after several hours of not hearing from her, they reported her missing. The police immediately started searching for her, but after several days, nothing was found. Even after the family put out five, a $5,000 reward for any information, no evidence turned up. The police decided to start interviewing those close to, closest to Don, starting with her husband, David. He told investigators his version of events and nothing seemed strange, so they continued on with their interviews. The family and friends of Don all had alibis, and then they interviewed a janitor that had been cleaning on the night of October 24th. It was then that they learned that Don actually left with David that night. This got the investigators' attention because this contradicted David's story, but no matter how hard they looked into David, nothing seemed strange beside the one, the one part of his story that was inconsistent and the abuse that went on in the home. Although these two things were suspicious, they let him go because they lacked any solid evidence to arrest him. After searching for several weeks, the case went cold because besides suspicion around David, there was nothing to point investigators in any direction. That was until July 11, 2003, when an unidentified body was found 120 feet below the surface of Geneva Lake by an off-duty police officer police diver, sorry. The body was found wearing the clothes that Dawn was last seen in and was bound by ha her hands and knees and chest with several feet of chains attached to concrete blocks. Although it was assumed that the person had drowned, 
It was assumed they drowned with all this on them. Police sent the body to the Jeffrey Jensen Milwaukee County Medical Examiner to recover any potential evidence. Using dental records and DNA, the medical examiner was able to confirm that the body was 29-year-old Don Broussard. Now police had the horrific task of telling the family. When friends and family found out about Don, they were glad that she was found and that they could finally lay her to rest. But more than anything, they were heartbroken and destroyed. But not David. David had a weird reaction, and although everyone grieves differently, police thought his reaction was odd. When told of his wife's death, David's, David was reported to be dazed and nauseous, with his eyes moving back and forth. After a thorough autopsy was completed, it was determined that Dawn had no water in her lungs, indicating that she did not drown. Oh, I get it. Okay, so like uh, they thought that she drowned, but that it was also suspicious. But okay, okay, okay. I thought they thought she was just going for like a little stroll and then accidentally drowned. This makes more sense. Dr. Jensen also identified several fractures to her skull deep enough to kill her in seconds and concluded that she had died as a result of blunt force trauma to the head by a heavy tool, labeling her death as homicide. Dr. Jensen struggled to find any additional forensic evidence due to the advanced state of decomposition resulting from being submerged in the lake for an extended period of time. The body's decom decomposition and contamination by the lake water destroyed all chemical, biological, and trace evidence that may have been left behind. However, Dr. Jensen did Jensen did find a shocking detail about the victim. She had given birth. Oh. When asked, nobody, not even David, knew anything about the pregnancy or the child, which made identifying the father of the child a lot harder. I asked my grandmother if she knew, and she said she didn't find out about that until after some details about Dawn were released to the public years later. Her car keys were also found, still in her pocket, and the watch on her wrist had stopped at 8.15. Officers took the watch to a jeweler and, were, jeweler and were told that it would not have operated for very long after being submerged, meaning Dawn had most likely died shortly after she and David had talked at 7 p.m. Officers then studied the items used to weigh Dawn's body down. They found that the chains were similar to those used at Action Marine, where David Broussard worked as a mechanic. While investigators were looking into all of this new information, a woman came forward with information about an affair that she had had with David Broussard from 1994 to 1997. She recalled that at one time during the affair, David told her he had seen his wife with another man and that he was going to wrap her up Dawn in heavy chains and cement blocks and throw her into the lake where she would never be found. That's a conversation topic to have with the person you're having an affair with. I hope that was a red flag enough for her to run away, which to me means case freaking solved. Agreed. Together, the witness statement, David's suspicious answering during the interview, and the discovery of similar chains at David's work allowed detectives to arrest him for the brutal murder of his wife. David was charged and tried for first-degree murder of his wife. Shortly after his trial began, another bombshell was dropped. An unexpected witness, James Tost Tostrup came forward to give his statement in front of the jurors and the judge. He said that he and Dawn had had an affair that started in September of 1997. After learning that she was married and only 29, he was 47, he cut all ties with her. But before he finally cut ties, Dawn told him about some of the horrors that happened between her and David. Tostrud told the courtroom, she said that when she asked her husband for a divorce, the following day she found their wedding pictures strewn about along with her wedding gown that was laid on the bed, a gun, and a note reading, Death Do Us Part. Ooh. When asked why he did not come forward sooner, Tostrad claimed he had been afraid of being suspected in Dawn's disappearance since the affair started only a month before she disappeared. Ooh. Sadly, after a seven-hour debate, the jury returned with a verdict of not guilty due to lack of evidence. <gasps> Although he was set free, police theorized that shortly after Dawn started talking about separating, David found out about her affair. He then went to his mistress's home in an angry rage, which is weird because he was literally telling this to the woman he was having an affair with. Very good point. During his rage, he let his plan slip, but ended up trying to play it off which is how the woman knew his plan. After venting, he went home, calmed down, and realized he wasn't going to hurt Don, and he needed to do whatever was necessary to keep Don in his life, so he ended his affair. 
In the following days, Dawn tried to file for divorce again, causing David to realize that he wasn't going to be able to keep her in his life. One day, most likely after a fight about the divorce, David went to work, October 24th, 1997, most likely thinking about how to save his marriage, but then he may have thought, if I can't have her, nobody can. So as his shift came to an end, he grabbed the necessary supplies to go through with the initial plan and went to meet Dawn at her work. His reason for asking her to dinner that night was probably to give Dawn one last chance, but when she declined, she sealed her fate. They talked as witnessed by the janitor, but instead of leaving in separate vehicles, David knocked her out in his truck and took her to a remote location. There, he smashed her head with a heavy tool, killing her almost instantaneously and threw her body in the back of his truck. He then drove to Lake Geneva and probably waited until after sunset to start up his boat, tie Dawn to the concrete blocks and dump her in the water. Then he played the part of a surprised grieving husband when he heard of Dawn's disappearance. Sharing helps heal. Thank you for what you do, Linny. Poor Dawn. I mean, n oh my God. I realize, I mean, there's a lot of time that passes. So evidence is not as reliable or usable. But usually I feel in those cases, you know, circumstantial evidence is very powerful. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It'd be so hard to be a juror on like an old case because they really hammer, you know, the beyond a reasonable doubt, are you sure? And I think we have it so, you know, ingrained in us right now just from watching murder shows or even, you know, just like the TV ones where they, you think the evidence just comes with everything and so fast, you kind of feel like you need that. So without that, when it's sometimes not available in cases, you're like, okay, well, I need that. So I, ca I can't get to where... Can't get to where I'm supposed to get right now. That's tough. Thank you for sharing her story, Linny, and not forgetting about Dawn. I'm sending you and your grandma so much love. All right, that is it for me today. Thank you to everybody who submitted a story. I'm working my way through them. If you have a story you want to share, you can do it at sherilynstories at gmail.com. Thank you again so much for your trust in me with this. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. I will see you in the next video. I'll miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other. Love yourself and I will see you soon. Bye.